Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Thank you to Chris as well for saving me, giving me the script and time to actually do this. Um, it's good to see you all. The uh, COVID is back, going strong again everywhere. Uh, Deacon Mindy, who many of you will have met, having been up here, she's down with it now. And it doesn't seem to be terribly serious, but it's very inconvenient and she's quite upset about that inconvenience. But anyway, stay in prayer for the folks that you know that are uh, infected so that we get past this and through this as quickly as we can and stay safe. Um, I am in the embarrassing position of not actually having the announcement. Are, are there any things that we need to announce, Lenny? The poinsettias are ready for you to take again. If you were here last Sunday or want even one another one, please make sure you take poinsettias. There's some in the fellowship hall, there's some by the tree out in the um, entryway, and there's two good ones right up here. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other announcements? There's one thing that's a little bit peripheral, but I wanted to see if anybody was interested. Uh, in Poway, the congregation there has been working on uh, a couple of things related to difficult conversations. And we've been working together with a, an Episcopalian church close by, which is called St. Bartholomew's. And they have different programmatic things that they do together. And the one that's coming up on the 19th is designed to help people uh, engage in difficult conversations. How do we talk about things that make us uncomfortable? When we're, nowadays, when we're talking about anything at all, whether it's about COVID or about racial issues or about um, what else is there? Uh, sexual orientation or, or gender identity, all those kinds of things tend to create a reaction in people to the point where we're uncomfortable even talking to one another. And so this little seminar that they're doing, it's a Zoom meeting, um, is taking place on the 19th and is designed to help people simply be in conversation in a safe way, in a safe place. Is that something that you all would be interested in participating in? Okay, so, well, what, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll make sure that the, the Zoom link gets up and gets published here so that anybody that would like to participate, you're welcome to, because it really is a conversation that will be helpful for us as we seek to just talk with one another about things that are difficult. So that's, that's one thing. Any other announcements uh, this morning? If not, then I'd like to invite you to rise and we'll join together in the Green Order for Confession and Forgiveness. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are tempted to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
celebration of the baptism of our Lord comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Luke, reading from the third chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. Glory to you, Lord. 
As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his grain. With the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed how the way in which we believe things sometimes changes over time? The things that we think about things evolve, I guess, grow, develop. I'm not sure what you'd like to say. And this is particularly evident among children. The things that they believe when they're very little change and grow as they get older. For example, when my kids were very little, they would believe almost everything I said. <laughs> they got a little bit older, then they became skeptical, and now they don't believe anything I say. <laughs> when we lived in Africa, uh, one of the kind of habits or traditions that we had was that we would watch movies together as a family because we only had electricity from about 5 o'clock in the evening until about 8 o'clock. And so after the dinner hour was over and we cleaned up quickly, we gathered around as families to watch movies because we had VHS tapes and we traded them around. I mean, there wasn't that many of us, so we traded things around. And sometimes there were pretty bad choices, but we would play these things over and over and over again until you could... Has anybody here ever seen Pride and Prejudice, the, the, the BBC version? Like it's like four tapes long. It's, a mini, it's anyways, it's a mini series. And my wife and I watched that so many times, we, we kept repeating to each other. Um, but for the kids, one of their favorite movies was Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And there are parts of it, of course, that aren't completely appropriate for a child. But anyway, they used to like Conan the Barbarian. And one day, my middle son, who was probably three, four at the time, said, Daddy, are you as strong as Conan? I said, well, of course. Sure I am. He says, are you sure? And I said, yeah, come here. And I had both boys come, and he was, I think, three or something like that, and the other one was five or two years apart. And I had them hold their hands like this, and I lifted them up like that, and they were laughing and giggling because they thought, look, Daddy is as strong as Conan the Barbarian. That went on for a little while, and I was able to perpetuate that ruse for a time. And then one day, not too terribly long later, the oldest, Jonah, came into my office and he had a concerned look on his face. We had watched Conan the night before because we watched it many times. We'd seen it the night before and he came into my office and he said, he had his hands behind his back like this, Daddy, if you're as strong as Conan, why don't you look like him? <laughs> I could have been offended by that. But I chose not to be, and I went up to him, and I, I, he was still a tiny, skinny little boy, so I picked him up by the waist and held him up high, and I said, look, see, I'm as strong as Conan. And he sort of accepted it and went about his day. And now it's to the point where none of my kids trust me to know anything at all, and they don't believe that I'm as strong as Conan. In fact, they won't let me change a tire by myself. Things change, we change, and in our text today, we hear of the way in which the writer of the Gospel of Luke reports the story of the baptism. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but the baptism of Jesus is reported quite differently in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the Luke version has some features about it that really are instructive for us. For example, and I'm, I'm, forgive me for reading this to you again, but um, I just want to read verse 15, just to begin with. 
As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered them, all of them, by saying, and he went on to give his answer about who Jesus was, and Jesus was coming. We hear in this story evidence that at the time of Jesus, not everybody bought into the stories, not everybody bought into everything. There was the need to report that there was a debate going on about who was the Messiah. Was it John? Was it Jesus? Was it somebody else? There were many people who had claimed to have been Messiah. And so the gospel writer, who announces right from the very beginning, that I am wanting to do this so that you have a clear accounting. Remember the beginning of Luke says, for as many as have tried to put together an orderly account, I want to give you this orderly account, Theophilus, so that you might know what the truth is. And so this is Luke trying to do this a little bit more, being down to earth, admitting that there was debate, admitting that there was not unanimity in terms of who Jesus was or even who John was. He gets right to the meat of things. And more than anything else, I think what we can say about the writer of the Gospel of Luke is that he was keeping it real, to use that expression. He was keeping it real because this story is pivotal. It's pivotal for theological reasons, but also for historical ones. Think about this. In the Gospel, in the first two chapters, we have the what I said last week, we refer to them as the infancy narratives, right? Where we're talking about Jesus as an infant, a baby, and the stories related to the announcement of his coming. We talk about John the Baptist and, you know, Zachariah and Elizabeth and that whole business. And then we get to the point where Jesus is in the temple at the age 12, and now he's 30 and at the Jordan River. And that's all that we have. We have the infancy narratives, and that now we're here. And this story represents the hinge between those infancy narratives and Jesus' ministry. So they're really important. But Matthew and Mark spend a lot of time focusing on the actual baptism. But Luke is different. He keeps it real. And he, he does it differently, I, I suppose, in four ways. The first is this. The admission of the fact that people were questioning. That people had anticipation. That people had expectations. That people had a vision in their heads about what leadership would look like. About who the Messiah would be. And it wasn't clear, it wasn't clear cut, it wasn't completely obvious. And this is important for us to hear because when we look at it from our perspective, we think that Jesus was absolutely accepted by absolutely everybody from the get-go, from the beginning, and it probably wasn't so. There was probably significant debate or even confusion about who this Jesus character was. And John was concerned to make that clear. And so Luke, keeping it real, was saying, yeah, people were questioning. People were wondering, even if John was the one. But John clarified. So that's one piece. We don't want to overstate the fact that Jesus was the Messiah because it wasn't clear right at the beginning that he was. The second thing that is interesting about Luke's narrative in terms of this story of the baptism is a part I didn't read to you. Now, you, I don't know if it was gone. Uh, the text when it was up there at the very beginning probably said Luke chapter 3, 15 to 17, comma, 20 to 21. Did you see that? It's the divided text, and it kind of annoys me when that happens, because the writer does what the writer does for a reason. And the two or three verses that are missing are the writers of the Gospel of Luke telling us about John's imprisonment, that John went to prison. So it was important enough to him into the story to share that in there, but it really doesn't have anything to do with the baptism. Luke is keeping it real. John was in prison, and we know what that story was all about. We know how that went. And it was difficult. Now, how else did Luke keep it real? Well, the actual story of the baptism itself, when we get to the next verses, the verses that refer to the baptism, it says this. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, was praying. This is post-baptism. The baptism's already happened. When all the people have been baptized and Jesus along with them, the, the image that we have here, sometimes in media we see a picture where Jesus shows up in the riverbank, everybody stops coming in, and it's just Jesus that enters by himself with John. But the image that we have here is, no, Jesus was along with everybody else. He was one of the people who had been baptized that day. 
And after he'd been baptized, he was praying. And during his prayer, the Holy Spirit descended. In the words used here were in bodily form like a dove. So this too is another feature of how Luke is keeping it real because he says in bodily form. It's not the enigmatic like a dove. What does like a dove even mean? Luke is being more specific in saying in bodily form. There was something concrete, something we could grab onto. And we saw the Spirit of God coming to Jesus and saying something to him. Saying to him, you are my son, the beloved. And with you, I am well pleased. Uh, this is, well, there's another feature that I want to share with you that doesn't exactly fit with this text. And I'm going to share this with you because it's the kind of passage we won't actually ever talk about. But do you remember in the Gospel of Luke, the very, or not Luke rather, but Matthew, one of the very first things we see is what we call a genealogy. And it goes on for verses and verses and verses. That so-and-so begat somebody who begat somebody else who begat somebody else. Have you ever taken the time to study those things? It's really tedious. And keeping track of who is who is very difficult. The genealogies, however, if you compare them, are different. And Luke's is different. It's marked by a couple different things. Luke mentions no women in his genealogies. Now, it's not that Luke is against women. In fact, stories concerning women, there are 43 of them in the Gospel of Luke, which is almost twice as many as in the others. Luke is concerned about the situation of women, but for the genealogy, women aren't there. But there are people there of questionable repute. For example, towards the end of his genealogy, he mentions Seth. Do you remember who Seth is? Okay, do you remember the Cain and Abel thing? What happened? Cain killed Abel. Bad thing to do. And who was the replacement? The replacement was Seth. Seth was the one, third one, who was coming to replace. And so Seth was begotten by Adam, and Adam was begotten. And so you have this not exactly really glorious personality stuck into the middle of this genealogy and other characters in the context of this genealogy, genealogy who are not upstanding citizens. This suggests that Jesus comes from people like us. The illusory notion that we have sometimes is that everything about Jesus, everything around Jesus, everything associated with Jesus or related to Jesus was somehow perfect or pure. And it wasn't. God came into this earth. God was incarnate in Jesus Christ in a very imperfect world. Now, why does Luke present it this way? I'm not sure, because one of the thorny questions related to baptism is a question that I'm going to tell you is a really annoying one, but it's always, always asked by confirmation students. They always ask annoying questions about Pastor, if Jesus really was sinless, why did he have to be baptized? Never mind. Just do your homework and go home. It's, it's a difficult question to answer, but what we believe in our church is this. Baptism is a gift of grace. Baptism is a gift of grace that reminds us of God's grace for us. Once washed, we need to be washed regularly. And Luther said that we have to put sin to death every single day. And there is a tradition which says that Luther once suggested that every time you wash your face, you should remember your baptism. And though that's probably not historically accurate, it's kind of cool when you think about it. My grandmother taught us something important about baptism. And its importance was this, that we have a sense that baptism is something that we do, that we bring our children to, that provides us with this gift of grace, and we believe this rightly and truly. But we also have a sense in some other denominations that baptism becomes a mark of merit. I deserve this because I trust this, because I earn this. In other words, it's not so much about me, but it's about God. That is to say, we turn it around and we make it about us. In our tradition, we believe that baptism is a gift of grace that comes without respect to our deserving or our merit, but it comes because God loves us. My grandmother 
whenever in the summertime, some of my cousins and I were at her house, she was on a farm. And at mealtime, she was remarkably rigorous about making sure that everybody washed up before dinner. And it wasn't just a casual dipping your hands in under the tap washing. You had to wash with soap and you had to wash rigorously. And she would observe how you washed up. And if your face was dirty, that better be cleaned as well. And one of the things that I noticed, because I would object to this, I was not one of the ones that would go out and play in the dirt like some of my cousins or my brothers. I, I, I never did that. I was more, you know, I'd hang around with people and usually be adults and do things with them. And sometimes I'd get dusty if I was on the tractor or something. But generally, I was reading a book or I just wasn't that dirty. And I thought that, Grandma, you got to cut me some slack here. I don't need to scrub down like everybody else. But there she was at the door with a spatula. The spatula she would use to correct anybody who didn't wash up enough. She wanted us all to wash up. And she said, I am not going to look at you and say, okay, you're not dirty, you are. You're not dirty, you are. All of you must wash up because you're about to eat. The salient point here is that when we remember our baptism, and when we engage in this wonderful gift of grace, we do so without respect to how good we are or how bad we are, how good we think we are or how bad we think we are. One of the things that, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that has been my great privilege, because I have people in counseling from literally all over the world, that's one of the cool things about COVID, not that, I can't believe I just said that, one of the cool things about the pandemic has been this, is that it's opened up the possibilities of communication worldwide because we're using Zoom now like we've never done before. I've never even heard of Zoom until this all started. We're using social media in ways that we've never done before, and so we're connected and able to be connected like never before. And so I have people with whom I'm working in Africa and Southeast Asia and all over the United States. And one of the people with whom I'm working, most especially, I mentioned her recently, has had a very difficult life. Um, she has been a prostitute. She was sexually abused as a child and has a very low opinion of herself. When she asked me for help, she was suicidal. She said that there is no way that there's any meaning for me. There's nothing left for me. And I said, no, no, no. You are a beloved child of God. God loves you. Oh no, God couldn't love somebody like me. God could never love somebody mean. Do you know what I've done? And I said, well, I don't know the specifics, but I've got a pretty good idea. And what I do know is that God loves you so much that if you were the only person ever to have been born, God would have come into this world just for you. I told you all that last week, remember? This young woman believes that because of what she's done, she's never going to get into heaven. And I said, it has nothing to do with what you've done. If you were repentant, it has everything to do with what God has done. And God has done everything for you. Because God loves you. And that brings me to the final thing about Luke's story here that is so cool. It's the very last verse. The voice of God comes, heaven opens up, and the spirit descends in a bodily form like a dove and says, you are my son, the beloved, and my well pleased. Do you understand that when we are baptized, when we remember our baptism, and that's what we must do, by the way, every day, just because you were baptized once doesn't mean that it's magic. Because guess what? After your baptism, you sin. <laughs> After your baptism, you sin, and you sin intentionally, and you sin regularly, and you sin consistently. And so that gift of baptismal grace needs to come to you every single day, and it does. But you need to remember your baptism. We are in a position where we have to remember that baptism. And one of the best ways to do that is to remember this last verse. <clears throat> that when God, in this bodily form like a dove, speaks to Jesus and says... You are my child, beloved, and I am well pleased with you. Because of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, when God says that to Christ, he says it to you. You get that? When God says that to Jesus, if you trust Jesus, 
and I hope you do. When God says that to Jesus, he says it to you. There is nothing about anything you've ever done that puts you outside of God's grace if you hang on to what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. God loves us, brothers and sisters, and this baptismal gift, the gift of Jesus' baptism, and remembering your own baptism is something that's so critical for us. It's why it's so central in most Christian theology. God loves you. And the gift of baptism reminds you of that every single day. Another thing that I'll just throw out there, and hopefully as a reminder to you all, is that one of the things that Luke does here is that hey, he has Jesus praying when the Spirit descends, right? Did you hear that? It says, and a voice came from, uh, no. Now when all the people were baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Spirit descended. The Gospel of Luke has Jesus praying all the time. In every major encounter in Jesus' life, he is praying. And that points in Luke's Gospel to the centrality of staying connected with God. Just a reminder, I don't know, I'm not going to lecture you on this, but are you praying enough? Are you connecting with God every day, multiple times a day? Because God's listening to you. He's listening for you. He's listening with you. We have a wonderful gift, the gift of salvation, that is for all of us. It has nothing to do with our deserving. Baptism is not a magic act where we go, poof, and you're good for the rest of your life. Because I tell you what, you're sinful. There's not one of you who has not intentionally committed sin that ends up being a sin against God. And it's not okay. But it is covered. In his love, God has provided for you the possibility of salvation. You get that. It's not about how much you can earn or deserve. It's about what God has already done for you. All you have to do is trust it. Lean into it. Luke's keeping it real for you. Jesus has done everything necessary, and even in his baptism, helps us to remember the gift of God's grace for each of us. So as you go from this place today, brothers and sisters, remember your baptism. It was a gift of cleansing, it was a gift of renewal, it was a gift of grace that is yours every single day. Not a magic act, but something to remember, to remind you that, and this is important, you are God's child. And you are loved more than anything in the whole world. And with you as God's child, God is most pleased. Don't forget that. And even more, when you get that, even just a little bit, and it makes you feel good inside, tell somebody else. Because the world needs to hear that. People are so sad and discouraged with how miserable things are. And they kind of are. But if God loves you, so what? You're a beloved child of God. Share that news. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks this day that we celebrate the gift of baptism every single day of our lives. That we remember what that gift means to us. That it means life. It means salvation. It means grace. And in so doing, in remembering, help us to be encouraged to share the good news that you love all your children and for all of them, every single one of them, you've offered the gift of life. In your name we pray.
and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, take now and eat the body of Christ broken for you. Now in the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and his most precious and innocent blood, strengthen and preserve us all in the true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us now to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all, strengthened with the riches of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give each and every one of you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.